There are loads of cool images out there of aircraft going through the sound barrier and generating those shock waves. Whilst looking cool, the shock waves do, however, create a few problems that need to be solved. What are these problems, though? Let's find out. Hi, I'm Grant and welcome to class 21 in the Principles of Flight series. In the first part on supersonic flight, we looked at increasing the critical Mach number to achieve a higher speed in the transonic range. We only really looked at the drag implications of this normal shockwave though, so in this class we're going to be looking at everything else to do with the normal shockwave. Something to establish with the normal shockwave that is formed at the critical Mach number on an airfoil is that it will change in position as we accelerate through MCRIT. It essentially keeps getting pushed further and further back as we accelerate until it reaches the trailing edge where it becomes an oblique shock wave, which we'll cover in the next class. All of the associated factors of the wave also move rearwards. And in the last class, I don't actually think I mentioned what the properties of a normal shock wave are. So I'll quickly run through them now as well. So in front of the wave, you have supersonic flow, Mach greater than one. And then below, sorry, on the far side, you have a Mach that is lower than one. So we can say that the velocity decreases greatly because it is going from supersonic to subsonic. So drop, large decrease sounds a bit more technical. Let's go with that. The shockwave that is formed compresses the air a large amount which leads to a large increase in total pressure, which is then quickly converted into heat. So we can say that the temperature has a large increase and that pressure that is converted into heat means that the total amount of pressure that we have drops because it is now converted into temperature. Because there is this conversion of energy from one to the other, we can say that our pressure energy is also decreased. And because the temperature goes up, that all means that the local speed of sound also goes up. The conversion from this pressure energy to the temperature, or the heat energy, it means that it takes energy away from the aircraft, which is why we feel the drag. The change in speed from above Mach 1 to below Mach 1 means that our dynamic pressure drops. And if you remember that total pressure is made up of dynamic and static pressure. If our dynamic pressure drops, that means the static pressure must go up. So there's a large increase in the static pressure. And because the static pressure increases, that means that the air is compressed a bit more, and that means that the density also increases. We will now look at what happens when we accelerate through MCRIT and the associated moving rearwards of this normal shockwave. So as we approach the critical Mach number, we have an increase in the coefficient of lift, which lasts until shortly after MCRIT until we get the shock stall that would occur about here. At this point, we have too much flow separation and the coefficient of lift drops off rapidly. As we continue to accelerate, the shock wave continues to move rearwards until it reaches the trailing edge at this point. At this point, all the flow over the airfoil is supersonic and relatively stable, so the coefficient of lift starts to rise again, although it recovers to a lower level than before the critical Mach number. The period in here is where we are transonic. The drag follows a pattern we have seen before. So we come along, we hit M crit, which starts to rise the amount of drag due to that wave. Then we hit the drag divergent speed, which causes this large um, increase in drag. And then at this point here, the wave reaches the trailing edge, which means all the flow over the top of it is supersonic. So the drag starts to drop and stabilize, but again, still a larger level than before M crit. This bump in our graph is the time when we have the wave on top of the aerofoil. And then after the bump is when the wave reaches the trailing edge. 
So when we're traveling fast, the compressibility effect of air can no longer be ignored. So we have to view air as a compressible fluid. This compressibility means that the air travels over the top of the airfoil and it causes more upwash in front of the leading edge. What this means in practice is that for a given angle of attack, we get a larger coefficient of lift. You can see down the bottom here for this angle of attack down here, we get a larger amount of lift when traveling at very high speeds. But because we're traveling faster, we get this shock stall effect and the loss of energy in the boundary layer means that our value for coefficient of lift max, our CL max value is a lot lower when we're traveling at high speeds than when traveling at low speeds. And also the critical angle of attack, or the stalling angle of attack is much smaller when traveling at high speeds. So due to that reduction in coefficient of lift when we're traveling at high speeds, that means that the controls become less effective. One part of that is because we have the equation force equals a half rho v squared SEL. We get a lower amount of coefficient of lift. That means that the overall force is lower and the controls can't produce as much force and it's harder to maneuver the aircraft. A second component of the control effectiveness being reduced is that the air will start to separate earlier. And if it separates before the control surface, along here, for example, then we have no useful airflow over the control surface. And it can be so bad that the controls become completely ineffective. And this is an especially bad problem at the elevator due to pitch changes associated when accelerating through the critical Mach number. These pitch changes occur because as the wave moves rearwards, the distribution of lift moves around with it in part due to that increase in static pressure behind the wave. So normally the center of pressure is a, around 25% of the mean aerodynamic cord. And as we accelerate, it moves rearwards and eventually settles at around 50% of the mean aerodynamic cord. But as it does so, it doesn't just go in a straight line it sort of wiggles around before settling at that 50% line. And because it's moving around, that means our balance arm is moving for our lift, and that causes these pitch changes. Another pitching moment can be caused by something known as Mach tuck. This is where the shockwave induced separation causes a reduction in downwash at the root and this reduction in downwash means that we have a lower downward component for our angle of attack at the wing, uh, sorry, at the tail. So normally you would have quite a lot of downwash. You'd have an angle of attack, which is huge for the negative, but you get this reduction in downwash. So you end up with a much smaller angle of attack. And because we have a smaller angle of attack, that means that our downforce is reduced. Downforce goes down. And because we have a lower amount of downwash, combined with this moving center of pressure that we just talked about, that can add to the problem and pitch us nose down. The problem then arises that we pitch down, we accelerate and we start to speed up, which means we still have a shock wave and we continue to have this reduced downwash and so on and so on, the loop continues. We solve the problem of Mach tuck either using speed brakes or by using something called a Mach trim system or a Mach trimmer, which automatically adjusts the horizontal stabilizer um, in order to counteract any pitch changes when traveling close to the critical Mach number. So as we increase in altitude, the density of the air decreases. So we have to travel faster in order to produce the correct amount of lift and not stall. This is a slow speed stall. But as we increase in altitude, the less dense air means that it is easier to compress. And the more compressible the air, the more upwash is caused. And as a result, the CL max value and stalling angle of attack are reached sooner.
if we plot the stall speeds on a graph, we see this pattern where we have the low speed stalls over here and the high speed shock stalls over here. So as we climb, we have to fly faster and faster. And as we climb, the speed in which this shock stall occurs reduces and reduces. And eventually we reach a point where they match. At this point, the aeroplane is at risk of both slow speed stall and also high speed shock stall. This is what we call our aerodynamic ceiling. This is the highest altitude that we can fly at. And if we fly any higher, these lines would essentially cross and we would be both too slow and too fast. So it would be too slow and low speed stall and also be flying too fast and high speed stall. The point where these lines cross is known as coffin corner, which is pretty overdramatic really because at this altitude, you would have plenty of time to recover from the stall, but nevertheless, it's still not a very good place to be. And all the factors that affect a low speed stall, such as the weight of the aircraft, the position of the center of gravity, any maneuvers being carried out, and so on, will mean that the aerodynamic ceiling will change. So for example, if you're very heavy, you're gonna to need to produce more lift, which means you're gonna to have to fly faster, which means you'll reach your ceiling at a lower altitude. So to summarize then, the normal shockwave moves rearwards as we accelerate through the critical Mach number. And the normal shockwave causes a decrease in the velocity. It causes an increase in the static pressure and the density. It causes an increase in the temperature because all that pressure energy is quickly converted into temperature and because of the increase in temperature that means that our local speed of sound also increases and that conversion of a large amount of pressure to heat energy causes a decrease in the total pressure and a decrease in the total energy. As the wave moves rearwards we see the effect on lift as follows. We see an increase up to the point of M crit continues to increase up until the shock stall, at which point we see a large decrease until the wave reaches the trailing edge, and then there's a short rise before eventually settling down. The drag follows a similar sort of theory. We get a large increase in drag at the critical Mach number and a very large one at the drag divergence Mach number until the point where it reaches the trailing edge. At that point, the drag drops off and settles down, but still at a higher level than before the critical Mach number. The stall speeds are affected due to the compressibility effects at high speed, and it essentially means that we reach the stalling speed at a lower angle of attack. Sorry, the stalling angle at a lower angle of attack, but for any given angle of attack along there, we get more coefficient of lift. The control effectiveness is reduced because of this theory. We reach the CL max value sooner. So we therefore have a lower amount of coefficient of lift, max coefficient of lift, and that means that our maximum force is lower. The second effect is that the air separates and can cause no useful air to flow over the controls. They can essentially become uh, ineffective and it's especially bad at the elevator because we have the phenomenon of a moving center of pressure and Mach tuck. The center of pressure moves from about 25% to 50%, but it does so in a weird uh, pattern. It doesn't just go straight back. That causes a pitching down moment as the lift is now on a longer balance arm. If we combine that with the effect of Mach tuck, which is when the air separates and reduces downwash, which reduces the uh, downward component of our angle of attack at the tail, which means our downforce reduces in strength. That means that we pitch down even more, we speed up, we continue to be experiencing 
shock waves, which makes the problem worse and worse and worse and worse. To counteract that, you use a Mac trimmer system or speed brakes to slow us down. We also have the aerodynamic ceiling, which is where the speeds of a high speed stall and a low speed stall match. The low speed stall increases due to the reducing density in our equation up here. So the density goes down. That means we have to fly faster to achieve the same amount of lift. And because of this factor in here, the stall speed will uh, reduce as we go up in altitude because the density reduces, which means that compressibility effects are felt more this line essentially becomes steeper and steeper. So we stall at a lower and lower speed. If you cross through these points, you are simultaneously high speed stalling and slow speed stalling, which is what is known as coffin corner.